But here's two more pictures of Baptist church buildings. There you have Central Baptist Church. Again, see the slightly sloped roof of the Greek Parthenon and the columns. And there's another one, a big mega church that's Baptist. Greek Parthenon, columns. Oh, but the independent fundamental Baptists, they base all their practices on the Bible. Yeah. Sure. Mm -hmm. And the Easter Bunny and Santa Claus live together in Florida. You say, well, brother, that's, that's just a modern day thing. You know, I mean, I certainly, some of us fundamental Baptists, you know, we don't agree with Jack Hiles because he had some issues and he was a bit of a showman and things. You know, so that's only one example. All right, how about we talk about another Baptist hero of the faith? How about uh, Charles Haddon Spurgeon's London Metrop Metropolitan Tabernacle? What did that thing look like? Well, the first one, the first building, was destroyed. It was hit numerous bombings and stuff back during World War II. Uh, gee, I wonder why that would have been, you know. Second, though, the, the second one that they built, the, the final one that they built that's still standing there today, was built basically the same look. Do you have any idea what it might look like? I mean, take a wild shot in the dark. Take a guess. Here's the picture. Here's the old one. Here's the new one. Hmm. What a quinky dinky. I mean, isn't it just a, a remarkable coincidence that you have Charles Spurgeon's church building that he preached at, and it's patterned identically, the exact same architecture as a Greek Parthenon? It's the same thing. I mean, it even has the six columns out front. Why the number six? Hmm. Interesting number. But what is the history of this church building? Okay, there's the website to the article from this actual church. <laughs> it says, quote, the Tabernacle Fellowship goes back to the year 1650, 30 years after the sailing of the Pilgrim Fathers, and at the time that Parliament had just banned Baptist meetings. The Tabernacle traces its roots to a congregation which braved constant persecution and which met in a church building. Oh, no, wait, I didn't read that right. It says, in a house. You mean the early Baptists met in houses? Yeah, we're going to see that as we continue. Met in a house in Kennington uh, belonging to Widow Colfie. The meeting grew rapidly under its first pastor, William Ryder, who apparently died in the plague. Then came Benjamin Kiach, famous for his book Still in Demand, explaining the miracles, parables, and metaphors of the Bible. A prominent leader among Baptists, he led the church through much persecution and built its first chapel, chapel near Tower Bridge as soon as freedom came to Baptists in 1688. Huh. Isn't it interesting that they built a building right around the time American Baptists were starting to build their church buildings? We're going to see that. Why is it that all of a sudden you have freedom coming, there's no more persecution, so they say, let's build church buildings. And let's build them just like the Greek pagans did. And this is a move of the Lord. But here's a, here's a good independent fundamental Baptist church, brother. If you've ever seen a good one, I mean, hey, brother, this, this is a good one. The house of God, you know. How about this one? Oh, I'm sorry. That's uh, St. Peter's Basilica. Very interesting there that they have the same slightly sloped roof there at the entrance and the same Greek columns. Huh. Reckon that's a coincidence? Why would you have independent fundamental Baptist church buildings building their architecture the same as St. Peter's Basilica? You say, brother, St. Peter's Basilica has an obelisk out front and the independent fundamental Baptists don't. We're going to see about that. Notice also the round dome on the roof of St. Peter's Basilica there. Show you another picture of it there again. You see it. 
What about the exterior of the Second Baptist Church in Houston, Texas? Hmm. Interesting there, another round dome, very similar to St. Peter's Basilica. That's a coincidence, mind you. Don't tell me the Lord Jesus is behind all this. I don't believe it. Now let's look at the interior of these pagan temples. Here you actually have inside a Greek Parthenon. And there you have the idol up on the raised platform. You have a corridor that leads to the idol. And then you have columns that line the corridor. Okay, now notice the center corridor leading to the altar and the numerous pillars. This is inside of St. Peter's Basilica. You see, the roof is rounded in St. Peter's Basilica instead of the flat one like in the Parthenon, but it's the same thing. A big corridor, columns on either side, and the people go off to the sides. They don't go in the center corridor as much. But then you have this big, I don't even know what's going on there at the St. Peter's Basilica there, but you have that thing, and there you can see the people and stuff, the columns going up to the altar. Now here, this is very interesting. Here we have the ruins of the supposed quote-unquote oldest Christian church in the world, and yet it is built with the same center corridor lined with columns leading to the altar in the front. This is supposed to be in Rehab, Jordan, and it's, they call it the St. George's Church, and they say this is supposed to be you know, in the first century, that the early Christians went to Jordan and then they built this church building there. <laughs> uh, why would they build a church building when there's no, thing, no command in Scripture to build church buildings? I don't believe that for one second. You know what I believe that thing was? This picture there? I believe it's a pagan temple. Probably a bunch of uh, pagans, Greek pagans and stuff that were worshipping these other gods, Diana and, and some of these things. They probably had a, a temple of Diana there in Jordan. And now the historians come along and they say, well, see, it looks like the Catholic buildings and it looks like the Protestant buildings and a lot of the Baptists, so it must have been a Christian building must have been a Christian church. I don't think so. Especially not in the first century. They, would have been, they wouldn't have been dumb enough to do that back then. Okay, it had to take a, you know, a couple thousand years of, of church history for Christians to start getting pagan enough that they could think that they could build a building that God would move into. But now let me ask you a question. What about the steeple? Where did the steeple come from? There I have the link. There at the bottom of the page, I have the link there to this website. And they say here on the website, quote, In our phallic heritage, we are told that all pillars or columns originally had a phallic significance and were therefore considered sacred. Pan, the goat god and god of sensuality, was often represented as an obelisk. A former witch writes, the obelisk is a long-pointed, four-sided shaft, the uppermost portion of which forms a pyramid. The word obelisk literally means Baal's shaft or Baal's organ of reproduction. Page 341, Masonic and Cult Symbols Illustrated, Dr. Kathy Burns. Okay, so you have there the obelisk, which is, if you want to know, probably one of the most famous in the world is, is the Washington Monument. As shown earlier there in front of St. Peter's Basilica, there's an Egyptian obelisk. I love to ask Catholics that. Why would the Pope ship an obelisk from Egypt and put it in front of the Vatican? Can't they make them there? You know, what's going on there? The Egyptian obelisk is sacred, okay? They are Baalite. They are priests of Baal. Baal worship is what Catholicism is. And Baal wor worship has also come over to the independent fundamental Baptists. Are you kidding me? No, I'm not kidding you. We're going to see that as we continue here. Now notice the info on this website. It says here, a true Egyptian obelisk is 10 times higher than its width. Did you get that? A true Egyptian obelisk is 10 times higher than its width. Daniel chapter 3 verses 1 through 7 says, Nebuchadnezzar the king made an image of gold whose height was three score cubits and the breadth thereof six cubits. He set it up in the plain of Dora in the province of Babylon. Then Nebuchadnezzar the king sent to gather together the princes, the governors, and the captains, the judges, the treasurers, the counselors, the sheriffs, and all the rulers of the provinces to come to the dedication of the image which Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. Then the princes, the governors, the captains, or I'm sorry, and captains, the judges, the treasurers, the counselors, kind of sounds like the staff at a modern day 
Independent Fundamental Baptist Church. Uh, the sheriffs and all the rulers of the provinces were gathered together unto the dedication of the image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up, and they stood before the image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Then an herald cried aloud, To you it is commanded, O people, nations, and languages, that at which time ye hear the sound of the cornet, flute, harp, sackbut, psaltery, dulcimer, and all kinds of music, ye fall down and worship the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king hath set up. And whoso falleth not down and worshipeth shall the same hour be cast into the midst of a burning fiery furnace. Therefore at that time when all the people heard the sound of the cornet, flute, harp, sackbut, psaltery, and all kinds of music, all the people, the nations, and the languages fell down and worshipped the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. Now what was the golden image? Now most people, most commentators will say that it was a statue of Nimrod. It was not a statue of Nimrod. The proportions are not right. I mean, here I am. I'm about six foot three, six foot four, right around there. And if I put my feet together, they're probably about 12 inches apart, okay? So would it make sense to have 12 inches apart down there at my feet and my statue 12 foot high? No, okay? If you look at that image there, it was 60 cubits high and six cubits wide. Now, what did it say up there in that article about a true Egyptian obelisk is 10 times higher than its width? What was the image? The image was an obelisk. That's what was going on there. Okay? And is it any wonder that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego refused to bow down to an uncircumcised phallus? And i got to be a little crude here, brethren, and if you have children in the room, um, you might want to tell them, you know, because there's going to be some images coming up here, nothing pornographic or whatever, but, you know, I need to explain what this thing is. The phallus is a word for the male sexual organ. Okay? Sorry, I'm just going to be blunt with you here. All right? And when it's uncircumcised, that means that the foreskin has not been removed, and therefore it comes, you know, it's symbolized by the obelisk. Okay? I'm not going to get into some of the details. You can figure some of that, that stuff out on your own. All right? So what did the Jews do? The Jews were commanded to circumcise that particular organ. So that foreskin would not have been there. So what would the foreskin, the uncircumcised phallus, what would that have been a symbol of? It would have been a symbol of heathenism, of people that are in rebellion against God. That's what that thing was. So you have this uncircumcised male phallus there, this big image that's 60 cubits high, and they come on and they play this rock music or something probably, and they say, okay, everybody bows down. And there you have some Jews, Orthodox Jews, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego. And they say, bow down to this uncircumcised male phallus, this, this image of Baal, this Baal shaft, sexual object, perversion. And those Jews say, I'm not bowing down to that thing. But you say, I, I don't know, Brian, I, I don't believe this modern-day obelisk symbolizes the male organ. Okay, then take a look at what Buenos Aires, Argentina did to commemorate World AIDS Day on December the 1st of 2005. And again, I apologize for these images in advance, but it's important for me to show this, to show you how evil this whole thing is. There you have a picture, first of all, of their obelisk down there in Buenos Aires. Now look at what they did. They covered it with a gigantic, huge there, pink condom. What are they trying to symbolize? If that obelisk was just an architectural design or something like this and had nothing to do with the male organ, why would they put a pink condom on it? What are they doing? They're showing you what that obelisk really is. They are showing you it's the male organ. And by the way, it's interesting there, that perverted wicked nation, Argentina, had a big economic collapse years ago and they're basically in financial ruin. Gee, I wonder why. You know, could it be that maybe God has a controversy with a nation that first of all has these phallic obelisks and then decorates it with a pink condom? You say, well, Brian, uh, I don't understand. What does the obelisk have to do with independent fundamental Baptist churches? Well, let's take the parts of the recipe here. First of all, let's take the Greek Parthenon, okay? Greek Parthenon.
Now let's take the obelisk and let's put them together. What do you get? Well, you get a independent fundamental Baptist church building. And right there, that picture is an independent fundamental Baptist church. Greek Parthenon out front with the columns and an obelisk on top. You say, oh brother, now you're trying to say that the steeple is an obelisk. Oh, this is ridiculous. Well, here's another website link. You can go there and let's read some of this. It says, quote, the architectural gene genealogy of the tower or steeple displays other phases of the alterations of the upright. All towers are descendants of the biblical votive stones and in multiplying have changed in aspect according to the ideas of the people of the con country in which they were raised. This architectural genealogy of the tower or steeple gives many varieties. The groups on page 244 supply new changes in the tower or upright and furnish evidence how it passed into the Christian times and became the steeple. When thus changed and reproduced according to the architectural ideas of the builders of the different countries where the same memorial pillar was raised, it assumed in time the peculiarities of the Gothic or pointed style. The steeples of the churches, the figures of which we give on page 244 indicate the gradual growth and expansion of the Romantic or pointed architecture which is generally called Gothic and they prove how the upright or original phallic form was adopted and gradually mingled in Christian architecture in reality at last becoming its dominant feature. Now do you realize what you just read? Well actually let's continue here real quick there's another one Figure 96 there represents one of the western towers of St. Paul's Cathedral, London, which is one of the double lithoi or obelisks placed always in front of every temple, Christian as well as heathen. Do you realize what you just read? What is the steeple? The steeple is an obelisk. Pointed shaft going up. So, when you see that on top of a building in the past, a first century Christian coming to today, you'd say, hey, why don't you come down and, and fellowship at our local church, you know? And they'd be like, uh, you mean like a gathering of people? Well, yeah, we meet in the building. Okay, I guess. And they'd be walking along and you'd say, oh, there it is. And they'd go, wait a second, I'm not going in that place. Why not? Well, it's a Greek Parthenon and it's got an obelisk on the top. That thing must be a place where they worship Baal. That's what they would have thought. I guarantee you that's what they would have thought. And an Orthodox Jew, you know, you take Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and you say, bow down, worship the image. I'm not doing it. Hey, why don't you come on in to our local church here? They'd look at that and they'd say, are you nuts? Where's the fiery furnace? Throw me in it. <laughs> I'm not going into that building. I'm not going to go into there and, that, and worship that image the same image that Nebuchadnezzar set up. Now I'll grant you, you know, there aren't too many independent fundamental Baptist church buildings out there that have a solid gold image, you know. But the point is, they have them. They have the steeple. And you know, back in the past they would have had a bell up in the thing that they'd ring in, you know, the hour and all that other stuff. But now, a lot of these independent fundamental Baptist church buildings don't have a bell in there, but yet they still erect, erect the steeple. Why? What's the function? If there's no bell in there, why are you putting the thing up? Why is it that you have to make it look like the Greek Parthenon and the obelisk on the roof? Why? Why? Tell me. Show me from the Bible. Correct me. Show me where they were doing this in the first century. Show me where this is authorized in Scripture. It's not in there. And you are doing something that God cannot bless. And I'll grant you, a lot of people do it ignorantly. Like I said, the entire time I was going to independent fundamental Baptist church buildings, I had no idea what I was being part of. I had no idea that I was walking into a building that literally was a phallus house. Literally has a male phallus on top of it, and it's a Greek pagan building. I had no idea. But you know what I saw when I went into those places? I saw strife. I saw contention. I saw division. I saw problems. I saw couples 
that I thought were strong Christians. And next thing you know, the man's running off with some other woman. You know, Jack Hiles, his church building there, his son-in-law, Jack Scapp, he had zipper trouble. Fornication with a young woman, a minor. <laughs> and he goes to prison for it. And how many times has that thing happened? Over and over and over and over again. You know why? You know why a lot of these independent fundamental Baptists are having problems controlling their sexual lust? Because they're in a house that's dedicated to worshiping Baal. I mean, think about, just, just think about this, and I'm sorry to be a little bit, you know, gross here again, but uh, what if they replaced the obelisk on the, you know, the steeple, excuse me. What if they replaced that on top of the building with an actual lifelike image of a male phallus? Would you walk into the place? Of course not. Oh, but if you stylize it and make it look like a steeple, then it's okay. It's not okay, brethren. It is an abomination. And God is going to put an end to this system very, very soon. And ironically, the people who are going to put an end to the independent fundamental Baptist church buildings are the very people who worship the male phallus. You say, who's that? Sodomites. Isn't that ironic? Isn't it ironic that God is actually going to use sodomites to put an end to IFB buildings? You say, how are they going to do that? Through legislation. If you've been watching the news, you have seen the fact that Russia said, we're not going to have sodomy over here with the Olympics. And they have now been forced by the international community, they've now been forced to say that sodomy, you know, we won't make a stand against it and stuff. Now, if they can force a country like Russia to bow to the sodomite agenda, don't you think that they can do it with church buildings? And I heard uh, Brother James from Ex-Catholics for Christ recently talked about how that the churches in the UK now are totally, all of them, you know, sodomite marriage is now legal. Now there's an exemption form right now he was saying about that you don't have to take the, you know, marry a sodomite couple. But that's only just one little, you know, pen stroke away from some legislator saying, no, that's not, that's not uh, according to human rights or something. I'm telling you, brethren, it's going to get bad. All right? The sodomite agenda is going to push right into these church buildings. Why? Because they're not of God. There's no sanctuary there. You can't say, oh, the devil's coming. I'm going to run into this Greek pagan phallus house. And God will protect me there because it's the house of God, brother. It's not the house of God. Unless you're talking about the God of this world or the God Baal, you know. But let's get back to the article. The article there, a brief survey of independent fundamental Baptist churches. Quote, Baptists basing their beliefs solely on the Bible and the New Testament. Another thing he says there in the article. Yeah, right. You know, I don't think so. Quote, As with any true New Testament church, its validity as a true church approved of God does not, nor ha or has ever, that's a misprint there, nor or, but uh, nor has ever rested on its name or an on a succession of churches, a true New Testament church must be solely discerned based on its adherence to the principles of God's word. Okay, then that disqualifies all modern IFB church buildings. They're not true New Testament churches. Quote, The line of English churches that can be traced who called themselves Baptists began in 1610 in Holland. This is not to say that there were no Baptists in Britain earlier, but that it, this began a line of churches whose history can be traced. It began with a man named John Smith, who was an ordained bishop in the Church of England. In 1606, after nine months of soul-searching and study of the New Testament, he was convinced the doctrines and practices of the Church of England were not biblical, and thus he resigned as, a, as priest and left the church. Because of persecution by the Anglican Church of all who disagreed with it and who refused to agree to its authority, John Smith had to flee England. In Amsterdam, he, with Thomas Helwys and 36 others, formed the first Baptist church of English people known to have stood for bap baptism of believers only. Excuse me. Smith believed the only real apostolic succession is a biblical or the succession of biblical New Testament truth and not of outward ordinances and visible organizations such as the Church of England or the Roman Church. He believed the only way to recover was to form a new church based on the Bible. Okay, end of quotation there from the article. And it's interesting because the writer 
of this article fails to tell the reader what kind of churches John Smith was setting up. Was he really a Baptist? Now this next one here is from johnsmith.org. Again, I have the link there in the PDF. Quote, Regarding the identity and associations of the Baptist Church, Crosby wrote, in the year 1683, the Baptists who had hitherto been intermixed among the Protestant dissenters without distinction and so consequently shared with the Puritans in all the persecutions of those times began now to separate themselves and form distinct societies of those of their own persuasion. In other words, uh, back there in the time of John Smith, the time of Roger Williams, all you had was people that were dissenters from the Protestant Reformation that said, no, the Protestants haven't gone far enough. We believe in baptizing adults, not baptizing infants. And so those people were going and doing their own thing, meeting with people of other like faiths. But they were not calling themselves Baptists. That didn't happen until later, when persecution stopped. Baptist historians in their books and websites too often remove the identity Church of Christ, which is what many of these people are calling themselves, from their sources, replacing the Bible identity with either Baptist church, church or just church. Both are a falsification of history. Continuing here, it says, And just where did this, the churches of Christ take their identity? As with all matters pertaining to doctrine, the scriptures. Romans chapter 16, verse 16 says, Salute one another with an holy kiss. The churches of Christ salute you. So those early Christians were calling themselves churches of Christ. They did not call themselves Baptist. Continuing here. According to Herbert Skeets in his book, History of the Free Churches of England, 1688 to 1891, um, and it gives the information there, there, was, there were congregations separated from the Church of England, baptizing believers in England prior to Helwys. Uh, Skeets gives the earliest date of 1417. Another date he quotes is 1589 regarding several congregations. Also, according to Skeets, there were no quote-unquote Baptists in England who held to Calvinism prior to about 1640. Skeets was an independent having no Baptist affiliations, having no axe to grind. Conclusion, Smith died in Holland, forming no lasting church and no church in England. It was his friend and co colleague, Thomas Helwys, who formed a Church of Christ in London along Bible principles. Neither started the Baptist church denomination, which came to being about three decades after their deaths. Hmm. It is also true the churches of Christ were in London prior to the congregation of Helwys and elsewhere in Europe. The impression left by historians, historians is that no church of Christ existed prior to Alexander Campbell and that Baptist churches originated with John Smith. Okay, let me just stop there for a second. Alexander Campbell was the one who founded the modern day Church of Christ system here in America, which is totally corrupt. You know, they believe in baptism as a means of regeneration uh, for adults. No, it doesn't work. Faith precedes baptism. So, but uh, you know, when you hear Church of Christ now, people think of the modern day Church of Christ. And that isn't what was going on back there in the you know, 1600s, the early 1600s and prior to that. Okay, that Church of Christ back then was not the same as the modern one. But continuing here, it says, Other Baptist historians take a line of succession back to the church of the first century. Of such a mind was Smith. Such is not true, but revisionist history. On investigation, the Baptist church in all its various denomination forms, denominational forms was an apostate movement which came out of the churches of Christ in the 1640s, from which it spread abroad into the world, there was no Baptist church of that name or denomination prior to the 1650s. Churches of Christ founded on biblical principles preceded the Baptist church from where that denomination came out, as can be with ease confirmed by the reading various confessions of faith as published by the Baptists. So what have we learned? John Smith was not the founder of the Baptist church. He wasn't. Number two, he did not build a church building and call it Baptist. That was not there. That didn't happen. IFB historians, the third thing we can learn is IFB historians are lying and covering up the facts of history. Now why would they do that? Well probably because there's some other serious doctrinal problems with the Baptist system. Hmm. 
But now we'll, we will uh, return to the article, A Brief Survey of Independent Fundamental Baptist Churches. Now the article discusses a man named Hansard Knowles. Or Knowles. It says here, quote, The Presbyterians who are Calvinists then took up the persecution of biblical believers and forbade Knowles. See, they spelled it wrong there too. I'm not sure what's going on there. But Knowles from preaching in parish churches. He, however, continued to preach by holding services in his own home. Huh. One of the last acts of the Presbyterians before the long parliament in England fell was to pass a law imposing the death penalty on anyone who was caught holding to what they called eight errors in doctrine. These doctrines included infant baptism. Nolis was imprisoned many times and suffered at the hands of the state church. Watch out for that. He is the only one of many such godly men who would not compromise God's truth. The crime of these men was that they believed the Bible was God's truth and rejected dictates of false churches and men. Kind of like what I'm doing right now. You say, well, you're not a very good independent fundamental Baptist. And these guys were in the past. Well, that's funny because these guys in the past preached and taught the same things that I do today. Huh. They didn't hold out for uh, church buildings either. They warned believers, stay away from that church building over there. It's corrupt. Just like I'm doing. Hmm. Interesting too today because we have state churches. And he was persecuted for worshiping at home. Let's get back to the article here. It says, quote, The beginnings of the Baptists in America. Roger Williams is credited with founding the first Baptist church on American soil. However, as stated earlier, the evidence shows that John Clark began the first Baptist church in America in March of 1638, a year before Roger Williams. Williams actually founded the second Baptist church in America. He is an example of those who rejected the scriptural errors of the Anglican church and the Puritans who were, who were rooted in America. John Clark was a nonconformist and received his university training among the pilgrims of Plymouth, England from 1607 to 1620. Bicknell, it was reasonable to assume that member or in fellowship with the Baptist of Holland as early as 1611. He traveled to America in 1637, arriving in Boston. It is believed he left England to escape religious persecution. Immediately upon arrival, he observed the division with the colony in both civil and religious matters. During the course of the next few years, Dr. Clark preached and stood strongly for soul liberty and freedom of religion. He found himself continually at odds with the colonial magistrates. He, along with John Crandall, Obadiah Holmes, came to, the, came to the town of Lynn, Massachusetts on a pastoral visit. They were visiting the home of a blind named man named Witter, who have run afoul of the magistrates by speaking out against infant baptism. The colony authorities learned of the visit and issued a warrant to search Witter's home. While Clark was preaching, the constables arrived and arrested them. After being taken to a tavern and being fed, they were ushered to a church service being held being held the pedo baptist there's some spelling errors in here but this is copied copied directly from the website continuing here it says they warned the constables that they were baptists and if made to attend the service they would have to testify because they were dissenters later they were taken to the boston jail and charged with holding an unlawful church service hmm. and disturbing the service they were forced to attend Wait a second. The founder, according to this guy, of the very first Baptist church was forced to go to a church building and they said, we're not going to do this. We are dissenters. We're Baptists. We want to be, well, he didn't say we're Baptists, but he said we're dissenters. We believe in worshiping in homes. Don't force us to go into this church building. And because of that, they were tried as criminals. Why would they be so opposed to going into a church building? Could it be because those men back then understood what these church buildings were? Papist, pagan temples? And they would rather go to jail than to go into one? Well, that's very interesting. Uh, they were then tried by the governor of the colony, John Endicott, and without accuser, witness, jury, or rule of law, were found guilty of holding an illegal worship service. They were fined 20 pounds each or sentenced to be well whipped. Clark and Crandall paid their fines, but Holmes refused and was publicly whipped with 30 lashes. 
These men continued to preach God's word, refusing to compromise or let the Puritan government intimidate them. Huh. And of course, you know, you can study this thing out too, but the Puritan government would actually execute people. And that's why you hear like these witches and they say, the Christians used to execute witches. No, you need to get that right. The Puritans executed witches. And the Puritans also executed Bible-believing Christians that believed in baptizing adults. Okay? Why? Church, state, set up. The Puritans were basically believers in John Calvin's system. John Calvin, the Protestant reformer, was executing people over there in, uh, what was it, uh, Switzerland, I guess, Gen uh, Geneva, Switzerland. You know, that's the whole thing. Luther set up a state church. John Calvin set up a state church. The Puritans set up a state church. And the modern IFB system is also a state church. And they persecute. Now, they aren't killing or putting in prison yet, yet, you know, independent Bible-believing Christians like myself who worship in homes or worship out here in, you know, God's creation. Um, they aren't persecuting us to that level yet. But uh, that could happen eventually. But they are state churches. But this kind of sounds familiar if you know your Bible, your King James Bible. You can turn there in your Bible to Acts chapter 4. We're going to read a bunch of verses here in Acts 4 and then again in Acts chapter 5. We're going to look, because if you remember earlier I was reading there from this Baptist historian uh, that he was saying that uh, we have the exact same practices as Christ and the Apostles. So let's see about these practices of Christ and the Apostles. Let's see about it. Acts chapter 4, verse 1 says, And as they spake unto the priests, or unto the people, the priests and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them. Hmm. Being grieved that they taught the people and preached through Jesus the resurrection from the dead, and they laid hands on them and put them in hold unto the next day, for it was now eventide. Do you realize what we just read? Those early Christians, John Clark and uh, Crandall and Holmes, those three men were doing the exact same things that happened back in the book of Acts. They were holding worship services in their home and they went. They were going to be forced to go into a church service and they said, we're not going into that building. I don't think so. And what was the result? They were put in, in prison by the magistrates. Same thing that happened there in the first century. Isn't that something? Verse 4, Acts chapter 4, verse 4. Howbeit many of them which heard the word believed, and the number of the men was about 5,000. And it came to pass on the morrow that their rulers and elders and scribes, and Annas the high priest, and Caiaphas, and John, and Alexander, and as many as were of the kindred of the high priest, were gathered together at Jerusalem. And when they had set them in the midst, they asked, check this out, get a hold of this one, by what power or by what name have ye done this? See? It's the same thing. Hey, are you licensed? Are you ordained? Are you 501c3? Do you have a right to be here? It's the same thing, brethren. We're going right into the same thing. And the independent fundamental Baptist churches are just as guilty as any Protestant or any Catholic out there. They go and they say, I bless God, brother, I'm called to preach. Well, let me get a lawyer so I can make sure it's legal. Give me some scripture for this stuff. It's not in there. Acts 4 verse 8. Then Peter filled with the Holy Ghost said unto them, Ye rulers of the people and elders of Israel, if we this day be examined of the good deed done to the impotent man by what means he is made whole, be it known unto you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom ye crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even by him doth this man stand here before you whole. This is the stone which was set at naught of you builders, which has become the head of the corner. Not of the church building that's pagan. Verse 12. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved. Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men. I love that one. They marveled and they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. And beholding the man which was healed standing with them, they could say nothing against it. 
But when they had commanded them to go aside out of the council, and we're doing a study on that in the future here, beware of the church council. They conferred among themselves, saying, What shall we do to these men? For that indeed a notable miracle hath been done by them is manifest to all them that dwell in Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it. But that it spread no further among the people, let us straightly threaten them that they speak henceforth to no man in this name. And they called them and commanded them not to speak at all, nor teach in the name of Jesus. Verse 19. But Peter and John answered and said unto them, Whether it be right in the sight of God to hearken unto you more than unto God, judge ye. For we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. So when they had further threatened them, they let them go, finding nothing how they might punish them because of the people. For all men glorified God for that which was done. For the man was above forty years old, on whom this miracle of healing was showed. And being let go, they went to their own company and reported all that the chief priests and elders had said unto them. And when they had heard that, they lifted up their voice to God with one accord and said, Lord, thou art God, which hast made heaven and earth and the sea and all that in them is, who by the mouth of thy servant David hast said, Why did the heathen rage and the people imagine vain things? The kings of the earth stood up, and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. For of a truth against thy holy child Jesus, whom thou hast anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, with the Gentiles and the people of Israel, were gathered together. For to, whoso, for to do whatsoever thy hand and thy counsel determined before to be done. And now, Lord, behold their threatenings, and grant unto thy servants that with all boldness they may speak thy word, by stretching forth thine hand to heal, and that signs and wonders may be done by the name of thy holy child Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place was shaken, where they were assembled together, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and they spake the word of God with boldness. Hmm. How very interesting. You see how the Bible lines up with true Bible-believing Christianity? You see, this modern IFB system, they would have been standing along with the church councils and the chiefs and the captains and the rulers and all that stuff, they'd have been standing with them. They said, well, brother, you know, you really do need to have a permit. You need to have your license there done and you need to be ordained and you need to... Mm -hmm. You know why? Because they're afraid of losing their building. What? Huh? What? You mark my words. I've dealt with these independent fundamental Baptist pastors for years now. Every single one of them is scared to death of losing their building. Why? Because they equate their building with God. Check it out. Prove me wrong. They will say, it's good to be in the house of God, isn't it? Well, you know what? Let me, let me just ask you a question. Am I in the house of God right now? Say, oh, brother, no, because you're not in a church building. Uh, sorry, but I am in the church of God. You see, I never leave the church of God. Why? Because the church of God is his body. It's not a building. Especially not a pagan Greek Parthenon with a phallus on top. You know. But notice a few things in this passage here. Number one, Peter and John were having great effect preaching to the people. And you can have great effect when you're not tied to some stinking building someplace. Number two, how did the religious and political leaders react? When they see true Bible-believing Christians having great effect, how do the religious and political leaders, and notice they team up together, what did they do? They asked Peter and John what their authority and power was to preach. Do you have a permit to be preaching here? Are you licensed to preach here? See? Not much has changed, has it? When the leaders found that they didn't recognize their man-made system, but submitted to God only, they commanded them not to speak. Now, you know, hey, brother, if, if you want to, you know, or friend, if you want to preach here, you're going to have to come down to the local magistrate and you're going to have to get a license to preach here. Otherwise, we can't permit you to speak. You know? And the Christian says, I'm not getting a license. I do not submit, I do not recognize your authority to preach the Word of God. Hey, submit to the governmental authorities and the purposes there where they're given the sword 
as the as the revenger of justice and things like that, that's fine. That's fine. If you're disobeying the law and you get caught for it, you know, okay, fine. Submit to the government at that point in time. But when they start to come into matters of religion, and by the way, when they start to come into matters of your own body, your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. This body right here. So when they start to tell you, you will and you will not do this with your body, you know, like healthcare type of stuff, they're crossing the line. They have no right to be in that. And you as a Christian have a right and a duty to rebel against that. 